Uh, welcome to the channel. Wow. What a train wreck. Elaine Warnos is crossed by the prosecution if you watched the last video. It was crazy. She should have never been put on the stand. It was brutal and terrible. But if she would have been tried today, it would have gone a lot different. I think a lot of evidence wouldn't have been brought in. They were wanting to bring in all of these other cases. And I guess at the time, it was able to do it, obviously, because it, it the judge allowed it, allowed all this evidence to come in. And we've seen in other cases of today, recently, you know, in the last few years, you don't see that. But in this video, um, I'm not commentarying through it. I'm just doing this at the beginning, and then you can watch it. It's really for the diehard curiosity fans of, well, I, maybe not fans, uh, is lack of a better word, um, people who were very curious and interested in this case with her because of her tragic upbringing and and all of this, that uh, her being the first serial killer, it brought a lot of attention. And obviously, I was curious and fascinated by it. And I had never gotten a chance to sit through through these these trials. Now, this these clips I'm going to show you is the count. Both counsels discussing to the judge without the presence of the jury. The defense is like, hey, we don't want this stuff in there. We want to focus on Richard Miley. This is her uh, her first trial, by the way, in 92. And the prosecution, for like 30 minutes, lays out every victim, tries to convince the judge the relevance to, to get it in. And, of course, the, the defense is like, this is prejudicial to her, which I agree it was because, man, it is damning. Uh, and she's guilty of all of it, don't misunderstand, but she probably would have been found guilty anyway without that other stuff, but I just found it curious that all of this crap was put in, and man, it was like a boom, boom, bombshell. And then in, in this clip, too, you're going to see the, the jury walking in, the camera pans, and they're coming in like like if you were coming into the courtroom to sit down in one of the pews, pan the camera pans around, and here they come, and they film them walking all the way through. They're in their coats. They just got there. And you get to see every juror, every juror in this trial. There's a handful of men. Uh, it looks like more women than men, and they, they're ranging from different ages as well. But the prosecution laid out all the evidence, uh, in here, so you're in this, it's it's going to be about an hour, <clears throat> but they're going to lay out every case. One of the bodies wasn't found, so in each uh, person that was murdered by her, they're going to say when it happened, how she killed them. So you get a good rundown right in the in this in this segment here. I'm fixing to play for you, and the judge said it, it it pertains basically and i was like wow because the prosecution is saying hey this is relevant this is uh you know she had a pattern she was doing it she was robbing them she knew what she was doing and blah 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 but anyway without further ado um i'm not going to be commenting on it which you're probably like yay so <laughs> so you can go ahead and watch the entire clip uh, I thought it was interesting, um, and hopefully you will be too. And thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy. So, by agreement of the parties with a number of matters off the record with Your Honor yesterday, one of the matters that uh, pertains to an order before the court today is uh, the order uh, appointing Dr. Bordini in the case. 
we would formally enter an objection to both the appointment and the scope of the examination. We do not think that there is any rule that covers such a procedure. Some of the objections are similar to those previously raised with regard to Dr. Barnard. In addition, we would specifically object to subsection two of the order, uh, paragraph two, uh, as involving an improper manner this time since the defense had neither opened the door nor is there a condition calling for such an examination. Mr. Chairman, Your Honor, please, our request uh, will be formally based upon uh, laws and procedures recognized by the court in their response to uh, anticipated uh, defenses, uh, either of a uh, mental condition, mitigation, and penalty phase, uh, or perhaps uh, even uh, with regard to diminished mental capacity at the uh, guilt phase if the court would allow such testimony, which has never previously been allowed uh, in the courts of the state of Florida, but uh, uh, I think we need to be prepared for that. I believe we stand on case law uh, well, well grounded legally. Yes, and I will mark that as exhibit uh, as we begin the record. Will establish that on December the 13th. Your Honor, not with all due respect, not to interrupt Mr. DeMore, but as Your Honor knows, the three defense counsels sitting before you also represent Ms. Wernus in other cases in other counties. And we would respectfully request that such chart be not provided in a public forum with other trials that are going to take place. And that the juries in other counties not be prejudiced by this presentation this morning. Judge, All you got to do is turn it to the court. It's the court that's going to rule on it. You don't have to turn it the other way. Judge, I'll place the podium wherever the court wishes to be. I can assure the court that the state of Florida will cooperate with each agency within it to see this woman's conviction or to work with you. You're the ultimate, ultimate uh, your ruling will be the ultimate ruling on this issue. Since you got a copy in writing like we do, why do we need the big chart? I don't know if that would be an answer question. Can we just argue since we're all looking at the same thing? So we don't need to do a little thing here. But Mr. Nola wants the court to do like try to get the jury to look at this thing in a vacuum and not understand the full context. Is Mr. Nola well, well, indicating that your honor cannot follow and bring the chart unless you have a big one in front of you? He said the jury. Focus argument part of counsel. I've been in the focus argument, your honor, and let the record reflect the district the morning. I don't need a motion. Let's yes, judge. No, just get serious. What we can see, what we see here, Judge, is evidence by this is that the dates that the body of each of these men was found. It also established that each of the men that was murdered by Ms. Warnos was a white man. And the age group was standing from 39 to as high as 65. Each of the men, as you can see, Judge, following the charge of traveling on the interstate highway. Each was traveling alone. And each picked up Ms. Warnos while hitchhiking by her own admission. Each had multiple gunshot wounds to their torsos. With the exception of Mr. Sims, who the defendant has admitted to murdering and dumping his body in a location which has not yet been found, each was found in an isolated area. On each of the victims, personal identification of property was taken. That is established by way of the confession of Ms. Warnham, as well as the physical evidence that is found at the scenes where each of the bodies, where each of these men are located. In the instance where the murder weapon can be established, it is established that a 22 caliber revolver was used to kill each and every one of these men. That particular revolver, Your Honor, was, was loaded with 22 caliber bullets, and each of those type of 22 caliber bullets were in fact recovered from each and every victim's body, with the mere exception of Mr. Sims, whose body has not been recovered by law enforcement officers. Though the defendant admits to using the same gun to murder Mr. Sims, loaded with the same type of bullets in her professional statement. The brand of ammunition judge will be established as each of the victims of the body were recovered as being a Stinger brand CCI manufacturer with a six right hand twist, a 22 caliber, and the same type of caliber and model and make and manufacture as is found in the mur in the weapon recovered in Rose Bay. In the instance judge that the pistol was recovered, you know by the defendant's own admission that is the gun that she used. There will be testimony that will be available to the state to link up the similarities and the class firing characteristics of each of the bullets that killed each of the men that are listed on this chart. Once again, Judge, all of these bullets were, were hollow points. They were 
jacket, and they were all recovered with similar type loaded ammunition found in the weapon when it was found by the law enforcement officer. On each of the vehicles, Judge, when the car was recovered, it was established that one of the car was taken from the victim's body. The body and the victims were all found in different locations by law enforcement. In the case of Mr. Sims, a bloody handprint of the defendant Aileen Warno was found after the call was wrecked by she and Tyra Moore on July 4, 1990. It was on the basis of that bloody handprint and the sighting by witnesses that law enforcement officers were able to develop a composite photograph, which eventually led to the identification of Tyra Moore and Aileen Warno as having a connection with Mr. Sims, the missing individual, and his automobile. Judge, found missing from each of the victim's cars was all of their personal property. All personal property had been removed from the cars, the victims had been, had been ransacked as far as their pockets, and a number of these victims who were clothed had their pockets turned inside out, exactly the same as Mr. Mallory. In each of the cases, the victim's keys, including that of Mr. Sims, were missing. No keys were recovered with the Sims vehicle after the crash, by the defendant on July the 4th, as well as any of the keys for any of the other vehicles used by any of the uh, victims, and then subsequently taken by this defendant as part of her robbery plan uh, and thrown away by her and admitted to in her confession. Each of the cars judge also had the prints, white clean of prints, with cars that the police can establish were located uh, in a condition that they could make a determination that no prints. Uh, would have been uh, would have been found. So what you have, Judge, is you have a pattern here. You have a signature. You have a fingerprint which establishes the motive and the intent of Aileen Warner to rob each of her victims. Now, Judge, in this case, I think it's obvious from the defense that has been offered and argued to the jury is that Ms. Warner acted in self-defense. We are offering this Williams rule testimony for a number of reasons, Judge. One is specifically to establish that the defendant did have a premeditated intent to commit both murder and robbery on the time here of the murder of Richard Mallory. This would also establish, Judge, for the purposes of the identification of the uh, ballistics report in regard to Mr. Humphreys, that a spent casing was found some miles away from Mr. Humphreys' body by the law enforcement agent. Next to or adjacent to that spent casing was a bumper sticker that had been on Mr. Humphrey's car. On the back of the couple bumper sticker in the gloomy area, a latent fingerprint of Mr. Humphrey's, the victim of Eileen Moros, was found. That casing was taken by law enforcement agents and taken to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, where Don Champagne was previously testified as courtroom, made a positive identification with the same gun as having fired that casing. Same manufacturer, brand, character, firing characteristic as was used to kill Richard Mallory by the defendant's own admission. In each of these cases, Judge Don Champagne will testify that each of the victims were shot with the same type of bullet, 20 caliber, with all the same firing characteristics as that of the murder weapon used to kill Mr. Mallory, as well as the casing relationship to Mr. Humphrey. Judge, in this particular instance, what we can establish is a pattern by this defendant of intentional killing along the highways of the state of Florida. It goes specifically to her self-defense argument. It is relevant to that issue. It is relevant as to the issues of the identity of murder, of the, the modus operandi of the defendant. It is also relevant to establishing uh, the use of this particular weapon uh, and it will also be established, Judge, as an anticipated defense, that Kyrie Moore was not present during any of these homicides and was sacked on some of the homicides, not within the state of Florida. So I think, Judge, there are a number of reasons why we're going to ask you to consider this. I would suggest to the court that the case law that we argued by counsel establishes clearly the admissibility of the similar facts that are connected within each and every one of these homicides. We ask the court to consider that on that basis. Mr. Noah? Yes, sir. <laughs> Judge, we're, not, we're not quite finished. Oh, I thought you were there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Uh, with regard to the, the proffer, may I respectfully use another exhibit in addition to the one? Yes, sir. 
that several of them were shot in the back and with multiple shots, some of which were for the specific reasons as enumerated by the defendant in confession to eliminate them as a potential witness. This goes to the specific intent of the defendant and the conclusion of it as she killed Richard Mallory. As an initial item that would be proven by the Williams dual testimony, some multiple shots to the back to the victims when they were helpless, unable to defend themselves, in conditions where they could not have in any way inflicted any type of injury to a lean warning. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Your Honor, the uh the monitor chart that we would like to uh, have you look at to assist you in determining the similarity and the pattern of criminality uh, in this case uh, is before you now, and it may be marked with an exhibit number uh, after. Uh, in, in the order, Your Honor, in which the bodies of the victims were found. Uh, the first involves uh, Mr. Richard Mallory, which is the, the substantive case which is on trial before the court. It's indicated by a red uh, marking uh, disc. And as you can see, the automobile and the body were found, as you have heard in this trial, uh, right in uh, northeast Volusia County. The next chronological uh, homicide that was discovered by law enforcement was the body of one David Spears, a 43-year-old uh, white male. His body was found in the wooded area of Citrus County on June 1st, 1990, in this area, uh, just down below the Orange Lake, between the Orange Lake and the Ocala area off the interstate. Is that, I'm sorry, in Mary County? No, I'm sorry, Your Honor. That was, I was on the automobile. His body his body was found in past in Citrus County. The automobile was found in the Marion County location, just off of Interstate. The third body found was the body of Charles Carstadden, indicated by the green uh, letter disc. He was a 40-year-old white male. He was found in Pasco County on June the 6th, just five days after uh, Mr. Spears was found, and he's further down the interstate uh, between Ocala and Tampa. His automobile was found up closer to the Ocala area, as indicated by this 3A in Marion County. Body in Pasco, uh, vehicle in Marion. And then comes Peter Sims, Your Honor. He's the, the uh, deceased, apparently, that was, was involved in some type of work connection, connected with the ministry. She calls him a missionary or something like that in her confession. But he was a 65-year-old white male. He was reported missing on June 22, 1990. His vehicle was found in Marion County on July the 4th, 1990, as, uh, here in 4A. Now, her confession tells us that she went somewhere up the interstate and a relatively short distance across the florida george border she uh where the uh, where the killing took place she left the body covered it covered it and uh, she just could not give us a location the body still has not been found but as your honor knows even uh, if we were trying a murder case and that was the only case you don't have to have a body to prove corpus delecti Body of Troy Burrish, also a white male, age 50, was found in Marion County on August 4, 1990, indicated by the orange disc. His truck was found on July the 31st, 1990, also in Marion County. They were in close proximity. Body was found in the woods, and the truck was found abandoned. Body of Dick Humphreys, white male, age 56, was found in Marion County on September 12, 1990. Is indicated uh, next to the Ocala area just off the interstate, and his vehicle 
was found in Swanee County on September the 19th. Up here just off the lake, off of Interstate 10 to the west of Lake City. Finally, the, the body of Walter Gino Antonio, a white male, age 16, found in Dixie County, November the 19th, uh, 1991, as indicated by the purple disc number seven off of uh, State Road 27. His vehicle was found on November the 24th in Bard County. Below Scottsmore. Your Honor, the area in which the killings occurred and in which the vehicles occurred were all north of a line generally drawn east and west from Tampa <coughs> over to Brevard County, just below Scottsmore. And on the north, just about the Florida border, Florida Georgia border, perhaps slightly above the border into the Georgia area, but within a few miles, according to her statement. Of course, on the east by the Atlantic Ocean, and on the west by a line that would be easterly of Tallahassee. This shows the area in effect of operation in which the the murder murders occurred, the robberies occurred, and the thefts of the vehicles. I'd like to briefly, Your Honor, uh, touch upon her reference to these murders and the statement, uh, part of which you heard yesterday, when she uh, gave her confession to Deputy Larry Moore and others, she talked about all of the murders. She specifically earlier as she went through her confessions, admitted six. She kept thinking that she'd only killed six people. She said she couldn't remember their names, didn't know what all their names were, and uh, sometimes got the murders intermingled. Because she talked about one, and said, oh, no, no, that was another one. And then she would go to that one, and then she would come back. So that's one of the reasons, that, at least up to this point, uh, we had not attempted to introduce the videotape of confession because it was virtually impossible to edit it in such a way that it only dealt with the Maori murder and make any sense whatever to the jury and maintain any credibility because it would have had to have been edited, spliced, and literally butchered to the extent that, that it would have been difficult to have a meaningful flow without having the surrounding uh, information and because of the uh, Posture of not presenting William Drew evidence early in the case, and certainly I think that was the better procedure for the court and, and for all of us. Uh, we were not able to present it. But let's, let me just briefly touch on what she said about these various killings. You've already heard how she described her killing of Mr. Mallory, but with regard to David Spears, uh, whose body was found in Citrus County on the 1st, 1990, talking about killing. Page 34, she says, uh, uh, truck, I mean, yeah. And when I got back there, he started getting vicious to me. I jumped out of the truck, and he jumped out of the truck, in the car, I mean, the door opened, the door, and grabbed my bag. I had the gun out, and I shot him, quick as possible. I shot him at the tailgate of the truck. Then he ran around to the driver's side, trying to get in. The truck towards me, which was weird, towards me. I just ran to the truck towards him and i thought what the hell do you think you're doing dude you know you know i i'm gonna kill you because you were trying to do whatever you could with me and i shot him through the door and then he was kind of he went back i went right through the driver's side and i shot him again he fell back and uh, that's all i remember on that one then she goes on to charles hartsgadon the man whose body was found in pasco county on june 6th She's talking about Mr. Parskadana. She says, uh, like that guy, I don't know, uh, he's a drug dealer. He had 20 bucks. And he was, he wasn't going to give me any more money. Uh, the one with a 45 on top of his hood. He's going to say, he would be there, and I found, found a spot and everything else, and he crawled in the back seat, and I crawled in the back seat. They're about to have sex. And he said, you fucking bitch, and all this stuff. And I said, you fucking bastard. And you were going to blow my brains out. I kept shooting in the back seat. And then I got out, and I kept shooting. 
Then I drove up 52 and dumped his body off, which is very hard for me to get the car and drive off. He was still naked. I was always stripped first. After I shot the guy, he crawled back in the back seat, and that was strange. See, the seat was over like this. He got in and laid down. Then he said, you fucking bitch, I'm going to die or something like that. I guess you are, you son of a bitch. You were going to kill me anyway. Then you shot him some more in the back seat. You reloaded. That was the question. You shot him four times. He said, when I saw the gun, I sort of flipped out. I knew he was going to kill me. In that particular case, he claims that he had laid a 45 caliber pistol on through his car. And, uh, I think she shot him nine times. He four bullets into him. Said she was, in her words, pissed off. Then on Peter's Simmons, Your Honor, this is the man whose body has not yet been recovered. But now, Georgia, June 22nd, that was reported missing from Marion County. He says, well, let me see the third guy. I had a problem with it. Let's see. I think the next one's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, page 36. I'm talking. He was a Christian guy or something. I, I didn't know he was a Christian guy. I mean, he was nude. This is the one in Georgia, I think. He had his, he had, uh, he took a sleeping bag. He took it out in the woods. And when we got nude, I had taken my bag with me that time. Because I said, well... If we're going to go out in the woods, I'm not going to give them an opportunity to rape me. And you know, this is a woman who solicited sex with each of these men and goes out there and takes her clothes. But she says she's not going to give him an opportunity to rape her. And that's this time this guy gave me a problem too. So I whipped out my gun and said, you know, I don't want to shoot you. And he said, he didn't say anything. He just looked at me and he says, you fucking bitch. And I said, no. I know you were going to rape me because he was getting physical with me again. And I knew, and he and he said, fuck you, bitch, and started to come at me. And he said, you know, trying to trying to get the gun from me. We struggled in that one. And he tried to get the gun from me and stuff. And we're struggling with the gun and everything else. A couple of bullets shot up here. And finally, I ripped it away. And I had the gun in my left hand. And I put it back in my right hand. And I shot him immediately. He goes on to say, I'm positive the only one I left in Georgia is that missionary guy. And you know, question here, she goes on to say, which I didn't know he was a missionary. I had no idea that she can't find the body. Talked about it being way, way back in the woods off the freeway and described that. She goes on, she said, I remember the missionary guy. I shot him once and I thought to myself, that you know, I really don't want to do this to you guy. But I'm going to have to, because you're going to, if you live, if I let you live, you're going to tell, you know, and uh, who I am and all this other jazz, and I'll probably get caught, you know. Question, so he had to kill him and silence him, basically, is that what it boils down to? Answer by Miss Warner, yeah. But it was bitterness of what, what you were doing to me. You see what I'm saying? Like, hey, dude, you're going to rape me. You're going to kill me or, or whatever you're going to do. It's not going to happen because now I'm, the, I'm on the other end of the stick. See? Question. You're in control? Yeah. Troy Burris, who's a delivery man, drove a sausage truck. County. His body was found August the 4th. She goes on to talk about him. She says, and then we, we got this guy in the truck. Question. We got this guy in the truck, sausage truck. He gives the location. He asked her, did you do that with two? And she said, huh? And then she goes on to say, well, I remember him. He's the one. He has to ask me what? He was going to kill him. Question, which guy was that now? Answer, in the sausage truck. Question, the guy in the sausage truck was going to kill you? Answer, oh, yeah. Question, how many times? How many times did you shoot him? Answer, God, let me see, let me see. I shot, I shot. He was, uh, he physically attacked me and he was, he, he, he left. He pulled out a $10 bill. This is all you fucking deserve, you fucking whore, like that. And I said, I said, wait. And then he just, he threw the fucking money down. He was standing in front of the truck here. He had the door open here. He just came. He didn't know that I had a gun or anything. He came at me. We were fighting. I mean, we were all the way in the weeds and everything, fighting. I got away from him and ran back to the truck. I had my gun in the back. 
I ran in the back real quick. Now he was still fighting. He realized I got a gun. Now I finally got a fighting, and somehow he I kicked him or something. He backed away or something, or, or I pushed him or something like that. He backed away, and I pulled my gun out, and I said, you bastard. And I, I think I shot him right in the stomach or something. Question. Okay, did you shoot him again after that? Yeah. Because he, oh yeah, I shot him, and he turned around, turned around, and he was going to start running. So I shot him again in the back, if I remember right. Question. So all these men you killed, you used the same gun each time? Uh-huh. Was the answer. She talks more about the killing Mr. Burris. She says that uh, he started running and I shot him in the back. Then, he, then I ran up to him. He fucking bastard. Boom. I shot him again. I shot him three times. Question by Mr. Mantra on page 56. Okay, so when he started to run away, didn't you just think you could just let him go? I mean, he's way out there in the woods, or he telephone for miles. No, he wasn't. Uh, he was running towards me. Shot him. Then he started to go away from me, and I shot him again because I thought, well, you know, the bastard, he's going to rape me and shit. Did you have to chase him to catch him? No, he didn't run very far. She goes on to talk about Dick Humphreys. He worked for the HRS. Uh, part of John. His body was found September 12, 1990 in Marion County. Talked about him. She says, and I pushed him away again. And I pushed him. And he kind of went to the side of the car. And I shot him there. And he walked. Kind of, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 38F. And he walked up to me. And he started struggling with me. Then I shot him. And then he stepped back. Lost his pudding on his little grill job. The question is a little incomplete. He says, picked him off the ground. I couldn't understand what that meant. What the answer was a yell, and then he got back up and he started counting me again. So I shot him again. And then when he fell, I said, Man, you're an asshole. Why the hell did you? I would never hurt you or nothing, man. I had to for the road, and then he was doing, I felt sorry for him because he was gurgling and all that bullshit. I shot him in the head and tried to get him out of his misery. Walter Antonio, retired police officer, John body found in Dixie County on November the 19th, the last killing we know about. Said, How many times did you shoot him? Twice, I think. Okay, now, uh, did you feel when he thought he was a cop? Answer at first, I because that one guy, the HRS guy, was telling me he was a cop. I said to myself, This he's that guy was an HRS guy, so this is another faker. He's just trying to get a free piece of ass, and that's all I thought. He was going to say, Yeah, it pissed me off because he he said this guy's a I said this guy's a faker. He's trying to get a free piece of ass. Question. Well, when he shot him the first time, what did he do? Mm -hmm. Well, we were struggling with the gun and everything else again. He fell on the ground. He started to run back, run away. And I shot him in the back, right in the back. And then I questioned, what What did he do then after you shot him in the back? Answer, he just kind of looked at me for a second. And he said something like, uh, shit. What did he say? I think he said, you cunt, or something like that. Um, um, you cunt or something like that. And I said, you bastard, and I shot him again. And then what happened? And then I just got in the car and took off. Did he say anything more after you shot him? No. Did you shoot him in the back again? Did you shoot him someplace else? Oh, I think I shot him in the back. One more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I shot him near the head or something like that. I just kind of ran and shot. I kind of turned my head and shot. Your Honor, we would uh, like to present a legal argument uh, in a moment. May I have this? Yes, sir. Your Honor, the previous court uh, that we instructed that it was clear we're going to be uh, going to tell the jury. 
specific briefcase identifiable as being that of the victim. Uh, other personal property of Mr. Humphrey was also located inside the storage area that was rented by the defendant. In regard to the killing of Mr. Karskida, a 45 caliber gun which the defendant described as being on the hood of the car was formed by the defendant using an alias name of Tammy Mark Green in June of 1990. That conflict was recovered. A fingerprint was obtained from it and identified as being that of the defendant in this case. Also, Judge, it was established that an Indian blanket was found in Jack's Mini Warehouse was the property of Mr. Karskaga. That was another article he was traveling with uh, when he was coming from Missouri down to the state of Florida, and the defendant robbed him of his property. Continuing on, Judge, in the case of Mr. Sims, whose car was found uh, after being wrecked by the defendant Tyler Moore on July the 4th, was the defendant's bloody print. Inside that car was a Windex bottle. That Windex bottle, Judge, I would submit to you, was used by the defendant in various cases to make sure she had access readily to wiping down the car so there would be no prints, so to prevent law enforcement officers from finding her prints on a vehicle. Only the wrecking of that car and the fact that people came upon them rapidly to see which the system caused her to be unable, and in fact she was bleeding from the wreck, to wipe down that car to eliminate any of her prints that she was able to do on the other vehicle. Uh, during the course of her confession, Judge, the defendant was shown photographs which had been introduced to them before this court of Mr. Marrow. In addition to that, she was shown photographs which established uh, in, her, in her story a facsimile of a badge that would have been carried by Mr. Humphrey, who was a former retired chief of police in the state of Alabama, which she identified as being an article which she had thrown away after shooting Mr. Humphrey. In the case of Mr. Karskinon, she identified his car as being the car that she had removed after shooting Mr. Car Mr. Karskinon multiple times. In the case of Mr. Antonio, she identified his motor vehicle as being the car she robbed him of. In the case of Mr. Spears, she identified both his face and the truck in which she claimed to have shot and murdered Mr. Spears and then taken his truck and robbed him of. Subsequently, judged in the course of the time of the interview, she discussed the clipboard. She described that clipboard belonged to Mr. Burris, the sausage truck driver, and the money that she took from Mr. Burris during the course of her robbing him of her property. And in case this judge of each of the individuals that are related to her confession, 
which had been already ruled to be admissible by Judge Graziano. She described the various properties in which the police have either located or been able, unable to look as coming from her various victims, her war trophy, after having murdered each of these men. In the case of each of these men, Judge, the autopsy revealed, and the physical evidence revealed, that these men were helpless victims. They were helpless to the extent that, Judge, in the case of Mr. Humphrey, the autopsy revealed the physical evidence that is available to today that Mr. Humphrey was shot no less than four times. Excuse me, Your Honor, I'm sorry. I'm looking at, um, Uh, Mr. Burris, excuse me, Judge. In the case of Mr. Burris, Mr. Burris, the shooting was described by the defendant uh, who was shot. According to the autopsy report, he was shot once in the chest and once in the back. Once again, Judge, all the bullets recovered from the victim's body were corresponding to 22 caliber manufactured PTI finger, hollow point, copper coated it uh, with six right hand twists, which matched the grooves to the, to the uh, weapon that is recovered. In the case of Mr. Humphrey, Your Honor, Mr. Humphrey was shot once in the head, twice in the back, has multiple gunshots to his wristed hand in a defensive posture, and has a total of six bullets or fragments removed from his body, of which two are to his back and one to his head, which is described in detail by this defendant as being a shot to put him out of his misery after she had shot him and incapacitated him after he had, she had been with him in his car. In the case of Mr. Antonio, Your Honor, the autopsy photo revealed he was shot four, at least four times, once again with the same weapon, 22 caliber hollow, hollow points. Those shots, Your Honor, reflect that he was shot at least once in the head to the back of his head, twice to his back, Excuse me, three times to his back. Three shots to the back, Judge, and one shot to the head, the coup de grace. The case of Mr. Carson, Your Honor, once again, he was shot with 22 caliber. Those bullets were recovered from his body. They matched in every aspect the manufacturer, type of firing characteristic was found with the gun that was found in Rose Bay. And there were a total, Your Honor, eight bullets recovered from his lower chest, upper abdomen and his upper arm. It's meant to you, Judge. Judge, and jumping back to Mr. Humphrey, the cartridge case, which was found in case to a bumper sticker, which was, which was healed by this defendant in her efforts to conceal his car after she stole it, was found in case to that cartridge case. The of the gun, which is now in evidence, was matched by the expert and established that that casing was fired by that gun. Once again, Judge, in each of these cases, the victim's personal property was taken, their bodies were left to rot in the woods, they were all found in various stages of decomposition, with the exception of Mr. Sims, whose body had been unable to be located, and their cars were stolen, and they were shot multiple times many of which were shot in the back and or the head to the back, which, which exhibit a, a fact and a pattern that this particular was not acting in self-defense on any of these cases. In addition, Your Honor, there were other similar fact evidence offered by the state in the form of the testimony of a Mr. Robert Kokos. Mr. Kokos, Your Honor, was, a, was an individual traveling on the interstate when he was confronted by Ms. Warner. Mr. Kovic says that on November the 4th, 1990, Ms. Warner approached him at a truck stop. She advised him that she had had a car problem, that her Corvette had broken down, and that she needed to get back to the Daytona Beach area where her two sick <coughs> children were waiting for her, and that if he could give her a ride to Orlando, which was closer, her sister would come to pick her up. On the way, Your Honor, Mr. Kovic seen within Mrs. Ms. Morno's bag, noticed a pistol. He became scared. As she came, began to talk to him, she propositioned him for sex. He advised her that he was not interested in that. He'd been a happily married man for 38 years. He appreciated the offer. It was nice for his ego, but uh, he did not want any part of it. When he reached out to her, she became agitated. She started talking strange things to him. She started to scare him. With that, he wheeled into a truck stop 
where he was able to get the defendant out of his car on the pretext by giving her money for her to go call her sister. As she stepped out of the car, he immediately locked the door behind himself. At that point, she screamed out at him as she fumbled with her purse trying to get something out of her gun that was within. You dirty old bastard, you're not the first one I've killed, you won't be the last. We submit, Your Honor, that that is William's rule testimony. It goes to our modus operandi of waylaying these travelers with bogus stories of a woman in distress and then claiming that they were there to sexually molest her. We submit, Judge, that in addition to that, we have the testimony of a Mr. James Dallarosa. Mr. Dallarosa once again picked this woman up hitchhiking. She approached him. She propositioned him. He turned her down. When he turned her down, she became agitated. As he left his car, she slammed his car door and began cursing at him. He was able to get away with his life. I would submit to your honor that once again shows the modus operandi, the propositioning nature of this defendant, and upon being rebuffed, the fact that she becomes violent. We submit that all of these matters, Judge, are William's rule testimony clearly. They go specifically to the heart of this issue. And I would also mention that defense counsel, in their questioning of witnesses, has opened the door in talking about composite photos and talking about uh, Mr. Sims's car and eliciting testimony themselves, which is open the door to the introduction of this testimony. So we would ask the court on those bases, Judge, to allow the introduction of the similar fact evidence as each and every one of these crimes, which the defendant has confessed to. And the murder of at least six other individuals in addition to Mr. Mallory. Good job. I also have your arguments as well. Yes, if the court wishes, I also have photographs of some of the items that will help to uh, uh, flush out the argument. Photographs of some of the articles and items that were removed and identified as being those of the victims, as well as the autopsy report the court can review and the victim's photographs. No. Yes, Your Honor. Um, you just heard over a half hour's worth of presentation from the state as to what they believe their Williams rule evidence will show. Mm -hmm. Under Freeman versus State, it's cited in 545 Southern 2nd 915, Chapman versus State, 417 Southern 2nd 1028, and numerous other cases, which we could uh, discuss with Your Honor on a later point if it becomes necessary. All right, this is the first presentation, 545. 545, 915, 915, 915, 417, 1028, and there are a number of other cases along those lines. Judge, we object to a number of other cases. The council has a case. Your Honor, this is an argument. You said I should not interrupt Mr. DeMore. I don't appreciate being in here. Excuse me, Mr. DeMore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We would also refer your honor to uh, <coughs> the previous that Mr. Daly uh, argued to the court on a previous occasion. In essence, once the state indicates to the court that it intends to introduce collateral crimes evidence, the initial question before the court, before we get to issues of admissibility, relevancy, all of those types of things, the initial question before the court is whether there is a quantum of proof that the state has to support that evidence. Um, cases usually, since most trial courts, the decision that they make with regards to that evidence oftentimes has a pre-trial hearing on it. Most judges not in the posture that your honor is in of having to decide this in the middle of the trial. However, the state bears the burden of establishing by some quantum of proof that the collateral crimes evidence they wish to introduce is real. It really is out there. The quantum of proof under the case law is clear and convincing evidence. We would submit that before Your Honor entertains the Williams rule issue, Your Honor should conduct a hearing at which Mr. DeMore will be required to prove everything he's told you in the last half hour. Prove by clear and convincing evidence that it's accurate. Proved by clear and convincing evidence that it exists. Only then should Your Honor consider the issue of whether the evidence is admissible. But until there is a quantum of proof on it, Your Honor cannot take the chance of introducing it and allowing the jury to hear it. The proof has to go both to connecting the accused to the collateral crime. 
to the validity of the fact which the state has proffered as to the collateral crime and to the relevancy of the evidence. So initially, we would request a hearing. And Your Honor, as I indicated, you've heard quite a great deal from the state as to what they wish to prove. Initially, we need a hearing in which some proof is presented to show, Your Honor, that this evidence exists. Absent that, all you have is an oral proffer, is an oral argument, not even a proffer, um, and you do not have a sufficient quantum of evidence before you on which to rule. Putting aside the issue of proof, I don't know if Your Honor wants me to deal with the evidence itself, uh, but there are there is quite a great deal that needs to be said with regard to the evidence. Initially, if you look at the chart, well, let me get to that in a moment. The court has a Williams rule issue to determine because of the fundamental importance of the right to a fair trial in the Jews has that your honor is aware of. When that type of issue is before the court, the initial question before the court is what is the evidence being admitted to prove? The second issue deals with prejudice and the necessity of the evidence to the state's case. And what I would like to do, if it's okay with the court, is to go backwards. We start with the necessity prejudice issue and to then turn to what the state apparently wishes to prove with the evidence. Historically, the two areas which courts have most often entered reversals on, when Williams Rule type evidence is admitted, deal with evidence which the state asserts to be necessary and not prejudicial, other courts find to be prejudicial and unnecessary, when the evidence confuses the jury, confuses the trial fact, or becomes a feature of the trial. In this case, the best example Your Honor is ever going to have of confusion between whether the evidence is being admitted to prove propensity and whether the evidence is being admitted on a relevant material issue is what you just heard Mr. DeMore say. What you heard the state argue in Mr. DeMore's presentation was, at its heart, a propensity argument. At its heart, it was not an argument dealing with preparation, intent, common scheme, lack of mistake, with opportunity, with identity, with most of the, with any of the classically recognized William Rule's exception areas. The argument, although some language was used, the argument basically was propensity. And that's the way the jury is going to hear it. That's what's going to happen when the jurors in this case hear that evidence. We do not try people in this country on propensity. We do not try people on their character. And we do not try people on anything other than the crime alleged in the indictment. What you will see the state do, should this evidence be admitted, is an evidence to present a case of pending prosecution. There's no other way to do it, I would say, given the evidence at issue. Secondly, the collateral crimes evidence will become a feature of this crime. Another of the classically recognized area of reports that found that admission of Williams Rule evidence was both unnecessary and prejudicial. There is no way that a reasonable group of jurors can do this evidence and not consider this evidence to be what the case is all about. And there is no way, as defense counsel, that we can allow, well, it's two issues. One is that presenting this evidence, the bulk of this case will become a Williams Rule case. Secondly, there is no way in good conscience that we, as defense counsel, can allow this evidence to be presented and then not cross-examine on it. By definition, what will happen in this case is rather than really ascertaining whether beyond a reasonable doubt the state has proven that Ms. Warnos is responsible for the homicide of Mr. Mallory, the collateral crimes evidence will become the feature of this trial. The collateral crimes evidence will be what this jury will be focused on. The collateral crimes evidence will be what is going to sway them one way or the other on the issue of guilt. And in essence, the jury's view is going to be either Ms. Wernus is innocent of all of these cases or she's guilty of all of these cases. Mr. Mallory's case will be lost in the shuffle. It is a classic example of a situation in which collateral crimes evidence should not be admitted because it will become a feature. 
Uh, you may have a different situation before you, the state were to select one or two of the other instances and focus on those, but you don't have that here. You have the state seeking this wide range of collateral crimes evidence to be admitted uh, that is unnecessary for the jury's consideration. Going back to the initial issue, to the relevancy of the evidence, you heard quite a great deal from Mr. DeMore and Mr. Tanner, but you really did not hear other than certain bold statements, you did not hear argument on why the evidence is relevant to any of the recognized Williams rule criteria. What you heard was a great deal about the other offenses. You heard a great deal about Mr. Moore's version of when they happened, where they happened, how they happened, uh, they, all sorts of things along that nature, but you did not hear how they fit to preparation how they fit to opportunity, how they fit to lack of mistake or accident, what they have to do with any of the classically recognized Williams rule criteria has not really been argued to you. You have a statement, we want this to prove X, and then you have a propensity argument following up the statement. In this case, when you look at the evidence itself, it is not something. When you take taking it in its totality, taking everything that the state wishes to present here, it does not fit into any of those Williams rule criteria in a manner that will not confuse the jury. It doesn't even fit when you look at the facts of the cases themselves. And, and Your Honor, I'd ask you to take a look at this chart, for example, to start with that the state has prepared. There are 22 categories on this chart. Um, those would be 22 similarities between the cases. Your Honor, we'll go down to the first category listing 22 caliber revolver used. And then you count down with me. One, the next one, two, three, four, five, six categories. That's all the same thing. All of that relates to a 22 caliber <laughs> weapon. What you have here is a chart, and then just to use the chart to look at whether these offenses really are similar or not, you have basically in a matter relating to the 22 caliber weapon, which has been broken down into seven categories, as if there are only seven similarities. That's not the way the case law requested the court analyzed. That were the way the case law was requested, but you can have categories here indicating all of the victims had shoes. They all wore socks at some point. They were all Floridians. So you can go on forever if you're going to make a similarities chart. But the focus is what is similar on the Williams rule issue. What is similar on intent? What is similar on opportunity? What is similar on integration, on identity? And then those criteria is where you look at the similarity. And under those criteria, what you have here is drastic difference. First, you have a case in which there is no body. So in terms of substantive proof, we know nothing of that deceit, his body has never been recovered. Secondly, you have distinct dissimilarities between cases, even from Mr. Tanner and Mr. DeMore's presentation to you. You have certain individuals who, taking the state at face value of what they asserted to you, um, were clothed, some individuals were not clothed. Mr. Mallory was not shot either in the head or in the back, certain other individuals were either in the head or in the back. Items of property were missing from some individuals. Items of property were not. Other items of property dealing with other individuals, there's no connection of this one. Um, you have a distinct difference in ages. You have a distinct difference in area. And that's the other thing that's something for your honor to consider. You know, the state provided you with a chart saying, another similarity is that you have this happening in this area. The area is North Florida. Again, if we're going to take that level of analysis to tie up similarities, we could say it happened in the Western Hemisphere. It's, it's not a limited type of area, it is a broad statewide area. Some of the decedents were found in wooded areas, some were not. Some, contrary to the children, were traveling uh, highways, some were not. These are not cases that are all interlinked. These are not cases that concern a common um, crime spree situation, such as the Remeda case, which the state cited to your honor the last time we argued this issue. Um, you heard Mr. DeMore indicate that one of the purposes of the Williams Rule evidence has to do with the anticipated defense in this case. And we would submit to your honor that until the defense is heard, so the defense decides 
what's going to be done defense-wise. It is improper for the state to get into anticipating what the defense is going to do and affirmatively trying to reflect what the other party has gone for. And finally, Your Honor, what you have in this type of situation is a situation where a reasonable juror listening to this evidence affirmatively or the defense has had a chance to go forward and not but see it as a feature of the trial. What you have at the same time in this case is the case where defense counsel have to address that evidence are going to have to deal with it. Not only will that make it a feature, that will put Ms. Wernos in the position of having to, in this case, testify as to things that would affect crimes that are not on trial, that are not before the court. It puts the defense in the ultimate untenable position have to address affirmative proof on something that is not an issue before the court, not alleged in the indictment. With those comments as to the general evidence, which are just pending in other counts, with those comments as to the general evidence, let me talk a little bit about Mr. Delarosa and Mr. Provis. These two incidents, uh, and again, taking the, the written, um, these two incidents have clearly nothing to do with the incidents related on the chart. Uh, if we are going to start bringing in the time an individual on trial lost their temper, that's what every time an individual on trial did something that other individuals don't approve of, say that. Well, if we're going to start bringing bridging up everything an individual did irrespective of how closely connected to the case it is, then we have truly put ourselves in a position where we are not following the precepts of the Florida Supreme Court in trying cases based on what is alleged in the indictment. And what we're doing is we're trying cases on someone's character. And the problem with that is if that is the case, that's the way we are going to try it, then at least there should be notice statutory or in the case of relating to us as defense counsel that we need to prepare a defense on that issue. At least there should be an allegation in the indictment so that we can prepare on that issue. Because as defense counsel in good faith, we are noticed that you don't defend cases on character and it's not something that counsel generally prepare. For each of those reasons, we submit that admission of this evidence at this juncture would violate both Florida standards and federal constitutional standards. And we would request that Your Honor not admit it. Should Your Honor entertain admitting, we would request that an evidentiary hearing be conducted in which the state can establish some kind of block of approval by the state convincing evidence. What has been uh, spoken here this morning that the testimony to be brought did not be removed. And it would be relevant to the uh, allegations contained in the indictment. And it would be established uh, to show an establishment plan, scheme, and design to identify the defendant, demonstrate a plan or a pattern, all about the defendant committing the crime of the insulation of the indictment, and not solely be used to prove that character propensity. Accordingly, the similar fact testimony will be accepted by the court. Uh, what is your first witness available to us? Judge, we have a number of exhibits that we like. Comments made and the party yeah. disagree, and let's, yeah. yeah. I've been through that. We're not an issue because of everything, so we're just going to do it in front of the jury to find out. Get these items marked to me. Your, Your Honor, let me, before you go, the, yes, our request is that a prompt be made as to the but outside of the presence of the jury. All the All I'm saying, Your Honor, is if you hear if you hear the actual Williams will testimony in the presence of the jury, once they hear that, there's no way for them to get it out of their head. So the prompt should be done. Outside of the presence of the jury, then you're on the rules, then the jury hears it. Proper the proper. Your Honor has denied the motion for yes. the record. Thank you. Let me uh, respectfully object.